working with this zoo, uh, this, this taxonomy. Um, and then I will focus on direct structures and the uncertainty of the interpretation of direct detection data and on the importance of actually considering all type of interaction and uh, if, if I have some time about the halo independent, halo dependent, halo independent formalism to analyze uh, 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 the, the data, direct detection data. So um, I have, first of all, a disclaimer. This is an idiosyncratic choice of subjects and certainly not a complete list <laughs> of citations because the citations will be huge. So if you have uh, any, any uh, question and so on, I will be happy to provide you with uh, more citations and whatever, whatever else. So, um, all right. So let us uh, have a small tour of the our local universe. So galaxies are the building blocks of the universe. This is um, a, a depiction, an artist's depiction of our own galaxy as a disk galaxy with a bar. And uh, this is the nearest uh, dwarf galaxy, Sagittarius dwarf galaxies. We have many satellites, uh, galaxies. These are some of them. Uh, these are uh, very well known from antiquity and large and small Magellanic cloud, etc. But many of them have been found in recent years, many of them by this collaboration, the Dark Energy Survey, all of those in red. So there are more than 40 uh, dwarf galaxies that have been found so far. Um, now, um, galaxies organized in groups, clusters, and superclusters, uh, every time larger and larger groups of them, we live in a group of galaxies dominated by three of them, Milky Way, Andromeda, and Triangulum. Galaxy and many other dwarf galaxies, the smaller ones. This is the scale you see as one million years. This is this is uh, there is a scale. Now um, we are like in a small town next to a large city. The large city is the Virgo cluster, so we are in the periphery of the Virgo cluster. Here it is. Uh, now the scale is 10 million light years, um, and then uh, of course this is now again Virgo. We are always at the center of this plot. And there are many, many other um, uh, clusters. At the level of superclusters, then the uh, structure of the universe is better described in terms of uh, filaments, uh, walls, and voids. Now, what is important for us is that all the uh, structures that I mentioned are dominated by dark matter. So um, here we have dwarf galaxies, our galaxies, rotation curve of galaxies, and even at the largest uh, scale. So let me talk about um, how we discovered dark matter. So the problem of dark matter has been with us, with us since at least, well, the 1930s. This is a paper, uh, it's a piece of a paper from Fritz Zwicky, 1933. And here you have dark, uh, cold matter. Actually, dark matter is a misnomer. Um, dark matter is not dark. Uh, this is dark because it absorbs light, right? So that's why I see it light. But in, in reality, a better name would be invisible matter. However, we have lost the ability of renaming it for historical reasons, actually. It's called uh, dark matter. Um, so what Fristus Bicke noticed uh, is was that, using the Virial theorem, he found that the galaxies in the coma cluster move too fast to remain bounded to the, to the cluster only by the visible mass alone. One can apply the same argument to gas. Gas in clusters moves too fast, namely it is too hot, and then hot gas emits X-rays. So you see this hot gas in X-rays. It's too hot to remain uh, in within bound, gravitationally bound to the cluster, unless th there is more matter than what you can see. Another method uh, to see the total mass of a cluster is uh, gravitational lensing. So. And all this data put together, so the uh, galaxies, this the visible, strong, weak gravitational lensing and X-rays measurements tells you that uh, there, are, uh, there is uh, in clusters there is six times, about six times more mass than the visible mass. The visible mass is the mass in all the star gas dust, things that you can see, absorb or emit light. Um, now, in the 1970s, um, Dark matter was studied, was rediscovered, if you want, uh, at the uh, galactic scale through the study of rotation curves. This rotation curve 
is a plot of the uh, orbital velocity of luminous object as distance to the um, center of a galaxy. And um, if uh, the matter would finish where the light finishes, for example, in our, uh, in our galaxy, if the matter of the galaxy would finish where the disk that I showed you at the beginning would finish, then um, as it happens, for example, in the in, in for the sun, uh, all the, mo the motion of the planets are, uh, around the sun, uh, the orbital velocity should decrease as one over the square root of the distance uh, to the center of the galaxy. And this is not what was seen. The rotation curves are flat, namely the velocity continues being uh, constant, which means that there is more and more matter. The matter within a certain radius uh, increases linearly with the radius. And so also uh, matter, uh, uh, dark matter dominates in galaxies more than four times the visible matter. So a galaxy like ours actually consists of a structure that extends maybe three to ten times um, more than the uh, disk. Uh, it's a, a spheroidal. We don't know exactly the shape yet. Um, and contains more than 85% of the mass of the galaxy. And actually, this visible disk that I showed you at the beginning is only maybe less than 15% of the mass. It's, 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 it's in the middle of the visible part in the middle. Now, at the largest scale, one has to use uh, general relativity or another variation. It has to be a fully covariant um, theory uh, because it, it, it relates a space time to the content of the universe. And then when we use data, supernova type 1a, large scale structure, uh, cosmic background, background radiation, and uh, baryon acoustic oscillations that we'll return to these two in a minute. Um, and uh, the uh, outcome is this, this really surprising, um, that dark energy, uh, which has repul repulsive gravitational interaction, comprise, comprises about 70% of the mass of the universe, the rest 30% is matter, but most of the matter is dark, dark matter about 25%. Our type of matter is subdominant. There are five different pieces of information, independent pieces of information that tell us that our type of matter that I will call baryonic because of um, baryons are uh, neut neutrons and protons, right? But uh, this is atomic matter, our type of matter. Um, comprises less than 5% of the content of the universe. So 95% give you an opportunity for many discoveries, right? They are not easy, but, but we don't know what 95% of the content of the universe consists of. So a lot of work to do. Um, so all data confirm um, the Big Bang model, a hot early universe, radiation dominated, expanding adiabatically, and then Therefore, the temperature decreases essentially inversely to the size of the universe is due to entropy conservation. The earliest episode in the history of the universe uh, from which we have data is a Big Bang nucleosynthesis that happens a few minutes after the bang. Big Bang nucleosynthesis in this plot is, is, is here, in this blue line, uh, 10 to the 2 seconds is this one, right? So essentially, we really do not know much of before. We don't have data from before. So um, about um, 100,000 years later, um, the universe ceases to be radiation dominated and becomes matter dominated. And a little bit later, and this is a coincidence actually, uh, um, uh, atoms become stable for the first time. And this is the moment in which macro background radiation uh, is emitted and gets to our atoms. And now the, the, the lifetime of the universe is about 13.8 uh, billion years. Now, um, what happens uh, before? We assume that there is a period of inflation uh, in which the Hubble, uh, this is this e to the hd, uh, this is the most, mm, uh, the most common type of inflation that is, uh, that is considered. And after which, uh, so this is inflation is signal here in this depiction with this fast increase of this size that portrays sort of the size of the of the universe um, after which the universe has to start this radiation dominated period in which a BBN happens 
So um, there is a reheating process to at the end of the inflation. And the moment in which um, the universe becomes radiation dominated, the temperature of the bath has this uh, temperature. It's called usually reheating temperature. And um, the only thing that the only bound that we have, we don't know much about this reheating temperature. The, um, the lower bound on this reheating temperature is very low. It's just 5 MeV. Um, so again, we invoke inflation to explain properties of the universe which are not explained in the Big Bang model, such as the homogeneity and isotropy. Th namely, we see parts of the universe that are at distances larger than uh, C uh, times T, t universe uh, of the universe. Namely, CT is the maximum radius at which uh, any interaction can happen. So um, parts of the universe that have never been in physical contact otherwise look very similar. You can see that very clearly in the microwave background radiation. Um, but there are inhomogeneities. Again, you can see them in the microwave background radiation. Uh, delta T over T, the level of inhomogeneity is 10 to the minus 4. So both the homogeneity and isotropy and the origin of these very small uh, entropy fluctuations can be explained by inflation. In, this ca in the case of inhomogeneities, uh, due to quantum fluctuations that actually are blown up and enter into the horizon as, as uh, inhomogeneity. Now, again, um, if the reheating temperature of the universe, namely the highest temperature of the radiation dominated period in the universe in which BBN happens, is 5 MeV, then BBN and all the subsequent history of the universe happens as we know it. We don't have any data from the universe really any remnant from before BBN mm? so when you when you s when you see the pictures that I show you with all these different phases and so on we don't know if that has happened in, the, in that manner that is portrayed so um, from Big Bang nucleosynthesis we have uh, the earliest remnants which are the observed abundance of, of deuterium uh, helium 4 and lithium 7 which are formed in the early universe and with, with what we know about nuclear physics and what we know about cosmology, we can explain the relative abundances, which are very different. Um, for uh, helium-4 is of order 1. For deuterium and helium-3 is 10 to the minus 5. And um, for lithium-7 is about 10 to the minus 10. Um, and you can explain this, these differences. But these are the earliest relics that we have so far. So many of the dark matter particles that, if we ever discover one, are relics from before this epoch. And we will try to use them also for stellar neutrinos, uh, axions, etc. Huh? They will be the earliest relics um, in many cases. Now, um, starting from what we know now, uh, as I mentioned, 75 percent of the content of the universe is about uh, 70 percent of the content of the universe is in dark energy, um, and then uh, dark matter constitutes 25 percent. I didn't mention that, but radiation now is about 10 to the minus 5 of the content of the universe. We can run uh, the densities back um, because we know that the radiation density changes as temperature to the fourth. Matter density instead goes as 1 over the volume, which is uh, uh, goes as T cubed. So actually, they cross. Uh, going backwards in time, they cross at this point that is radiation matter equality, um, before which the universe is radiation dominated and after is matter dominated. And uh, dark energy has a constant gravitational, a constant uh, density, and it has become dominant very recently. So a bit later, uh, and this is as far as we understand it, coincidence, is the moment in which we call recombination in which atoms became stable. That happens when the temperature of the photons is low enough that you cannot ionize the atoms that, uh, that are being uh, uh, formed. Uh, the name is recombination because it comes from chemistry in which you can ionize atoms and then they recombine again and so on. But in the early universe, this is again a misnomer. It's not a recombination. This was the 
combination. It was the first time atoms were <laughs> stable in the universe. So this is a big old combination. But in any case, um, so before recombination, uh, the uh, baryons are in a form, they form together with photons. So nuclei, uh, electrons, and photons um, are in a plasma. Mm? Uh, uh, and so the photon free pass is very small because uh, the there are naked charges, right? Uh, positive and negative. So the mean free path is very small. At the moment that the universe becomes um, composed of neutral particles, then the mean free path becomes essentially infinity. And th these photons that were emitted at the temperature that was uh, around an electron volt, red shifts, so the temperature decreases as the size of the universe increases. And now it, uh, it has 2.35, 10 to the minus 4 electron volt, which is 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Um, so recombination is also called the surface of last scattering because, uh, well, uh, the velocity of light is constant. So we see every epoch in the universe at a certain radius, at a certain distance, uh, which is c times delta t from that epoch to the present. And so um, we see this um, uh, CMB, and here are portrayed with all the um, different anisotropies, we see it projected onto this surface, the surface of last um, scattering. Uh, far away is long ago, right? Uh, it is given the distance uh, of uh, to every particular earlier time um, is given by C delta T. Now, uh, the existence of this delta T over T, when I say delta T over T, I'm meaning T at the particular location minus the average T divided by the average, di by the average T. The same thing, delta rho is the density at the particular point minus the average density over the average density. So these two things are related. They are both of order 10 to the minus 4. And all the structure that we see in the universe originate from this small uh, difference in density and gravitational uh, collapse. So uh, gravitational interactions tend to make over-dense regions more over-dense and under-dense region less dense, right? But you have to start with some degree of inhomogeneity. Nothing would happen if you have a completely um, uh, homogeneous uh, background. And so uh, all the origin, uh, the, the evolution uh, of, of, uh, of uh, um, the structure depends on the presence of these uh, small inhomogeneities um, at that time. Now, the microbanker radiation was first uh, measured in 1965 in Open CS and Wilson. It took 30 years, practically, to get to the inhomogeneities because delta T over T 10 to the minus 4 is very difficult to measure. 30 years. It was measured first by COBE and then another satellite, WMAP. Here you can see all the uh, inhomogeneities uh, together with the emission from the galaxy that you have to subtract. And so you, you, s you have a map of colder and hotter regions, colder in blue and hotter in, uh, uh, in red. Um, this was a map from uh, 2003. This was measured by, by with much more precision by the Planck satellite, uh, it's a European satellite uh, in 2013. Um, uh, now, the formation of a structure happens first in dark matter. In fact, um, baryons, this plasma um, that I mentioned, the, the uh, baryon electron photon plasma, um, during uh, until recombination, uh, during the, the, the from the moment of radiation matter equality until recombination, cannot really uh, fall into uh, structures because when gravity tends to compress in homogeneities, there is a slight increase in temperature. Uh, the temperature, the increase in temperature increases the pressure of the photons, the photon pressure, and it expands again. And uh, the result are standing, standing uh, waves. Um, and only at the moment of after recombination, baryons are free to fall into potential wells already formed by dark matter. If that wouldn't happen, there wouldn't be enough uh, time uh, to produce the structures that we have. Without dark matter, 
we wouldn't have enough time for you know homogeneities to grow from the size that they have. We know they have uh, at uh, during BBN, uh, during sorry during CMB production at recombination until now. So uh, this is a sort of a portrait <laughs> of this standing waves. So before recombination, grav the gravity attraction plus the repulsion due to the pressure in the photon electron barium plasma produce standing waves. Um, so hotter compression zones and cooler rarefaction zones. Uh, when when, uh, when um, the pressure wins and it makes the uh, inhomogeneity expand again, as it expands, expansion and, and expansion and contraction are adiabatic. Namely, uh, the temperature increases in the compression and decreases in the expansion. And so it becomes cooler, the pressure uh, decreases, and so on and so forth. And now, when atoms become stable, photons escape, they reach us uh, as the CMB radiation, and they show us like a picture, click, of these different inhomogeneities, right? that show us the hotter and the cooler regions as CMB and isotropies. And also in baryons, the baryons also, the baryons remain in aesthetical shells of predictable radius, which are seen as baryon acoustic oscillation uh, in, the, in the matter power spectrum. This, this has been observed the first uh, in 2005, and then with the higher precision since uh, 2012. So, um, in regions with a high initial density, eh, where there was a high pressure in the baryon photon uh, fluid, um, there was a propagating, uh, expanding aesthetical sound wave. And after recombination, at the moment of recombination, the photons go. But the baryons that were expanding expand by a little bit and remain there. So um, this uh, overdensity, uh, due to these aesthetical shells, uh, remains, and you can you can see it in this baryon acoustic oscillation. So they are the, the baryon acoustic oscillations are the counterpart in baryons, which we see in a structure of the uh, CMB um, anisotropy. If you have any question, uh, please ask. This is okay. So now. <laughs> These features that I show you here, we believe that they were caused at random. We have only one, one universe, but actually they were random. So where each feature is actual, actually is, it's not very representative. What is representative is the distribution uh, of the inhomogeneities. Right? And when you have a system like that, then um, what is important is the amplitude of uh, fluctuations as function of a scale. This is what is important in a system. And this is quantified by the power spectrum, uh, which is the square of the Fourier amplitude as function of k. k is the wave, the wave um, number. Uh, in reality, uh, for functions that are on a sphere, this is the sphere I showed you before, the sphere of last scattering, we use not, uh, we, d we, don't, we don't use a Fourier expansion, we, we use an expansion in a spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics have two numbers, L and M. And here you have the expansion of spherical harmonics, then you sum this expansion, and then you get with different coefficients. The, the square of these coefficients, actually for each L, the sum over M of the magnitude square, this is the angular power spectrum. As function of L, which is uh, the, you know, um, it, it, this is like um, the multiple expansion in electromagnetism. You see this expansion in electromagnetism, right? So these are multiple expansions of two. Now this appears, this, yeah. ah, okay. This uh, angular power spectrum, why it doesn't move? No, but yes, that works. Okay, yeah, that's it. Um, so the um, okay, so this CL here, besides this two L plus one that comes from a normalization of the harmonics, the spherical harmonics, it's just a normalization factor, enters in the temperature and temperature autocorrelation function. So what you do is to measure delta T over T 
at one point and delta t over t at another point, separated by an angular distance theta. Then you go all over the sky, hmm, always preserving that distance, and, and uh, you multiply these two and you make an average of this. And this is what is called the temperature-temperature autocorrelation function, and you see it depends, uh, it has a coefficient, the angular power spectrum, and these are Legendre polynomials. And so here you have, this is the coefficient that, uh, that I show there. Uh, this is what you have seen, I'm sure you have seen many times, these wiggles. Uh, so this is, the, um, uh, this is a peak due to uh, compression. This is maximum compression, so delta T is positive. This is maximum rarefaction. Uh, delta T should be negative, but since you are taking delta T square, you see everything, every single peak is positive. So maximum compression, rarefaction, compression. You see, this is what we knew before the advent of the data of uh, Planck. Uh, they were maybe three peaks. Now we see how many peaks? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe another one. Eight, seven or eight peaks with extraordinary precision, apart from other things that uh, I'm not going to mention, like um, the polarization, emotes, and so on. And what about the power spectrum? I can do exactly the same. In this case, yes, we use a, a, a Fourier uh, transform. Um, these are inhomogeneities of different size, and K is the wave number. Uh, so these are large structures. These are small scale structures. And if you see, this is the power spectrum, P. And um, if you see here, there are a few wiggles. Uh, if you subtract the continuum here, and then you can see the wiggles very well. These are the baryon acoustic oscillation. OK, this is my overview, because I'm going to mention now CMB and baryon acoustic oscillations and what uh, comes next. So any question? This one? Oh! <laughs> yeah, no, um, uh, it's very complicated. Uh, there is a um, very nice, uh, still I think the nicest, Wayne Hu, and uh, the, it has a very nice um, uh, website in which you can even tune each of these parameters and see how they move. Many of them have degeneracy. This, this is no, no, no uh, easy fit. Uh, and I am not able to tell you all the details because this is an ultra-specialized type of work. Uh, but even there are, there are degeneracies. You can play one uh, over the other. In cosmology, there are so many different parameters, so many different types of data that use Bayesian statistics. You have to assign your degree of belief. And so you have <laughs> different types of uh, results with some spread, uh, uh, given uh, the, uh, what you take as your priors, which results you take as your prior. So uh, these are very difficult. Uh, very difficult fits, but um, uh, but it but there are things that would violate the norms that we showed a moment ago. Like for example, alternatives to dark matter cannot fit this spectrum, and this is why I'm giving all this relevance to this because actually I think this is one of the uh, best indications for the existence of dark matter that we have. Okay, so now um, this doesn't work, but this does. Okay, so. Now we go to the properties of dark matter, what we know. So it has been 80, about 80 years since 1930. What have we learned? And as you see, we have learned, we will have learned a lot, but when, when I feel all, all the things that we have learned that we will fit in a page at the end, right? So first of all, dark matter has attractive gravitational interactions. Huh? Uh, it, it behaves for gravity in the same way like normal matter does. The only thing is that we don't see it. And moreover, it is there. So either it is a stable or the lifetime is much larger than the lifetime of the universe. So that we agree. So far, uh, we have no evidence that, uh, of dark matter 
in any other way with any other interaction but gravity. We use gravity to uh, learn all we know about dark matter. So always the idea is there and will remain there. Uh, could be, could it be that departures from the law of gravity itself explain the data instead of dark matter? So this is obviously a very, very good idea. The issue is that in order to test this idea, you need particular models that make a particular departure and then uh, it makes particular predictions that you can test, right? So, um, and so far, uh, dark matter cannot be replaced by any idea and modified dynamics plus only visible matter. Uh, so this is the idea uh, behind modifying Newtonian dynamics, MOM. This was done in 1983, eh? long ago. Uh, the idea was very simple to start with, that actually for very small accelerations, accelerations are smaller, and 10 to the minus 8 centimeters per second square, Newton's law is modified. Particularly, the right-hand side is modified. Instead of having ma, you have ma squared over a zero. And so you see that the force of gravity, of course, goes as 1 over r squared. And then the right-hand side, the side of the accelerations, um, also go as a 1 over r squared, because this acceleration is a centripetal acceleration. is d squared over r. So you replace, and you have 1 over r squared. So you see that r squared and r squared go away, and you have that the velocity is constant. And this explains the rotation curves uh, going to a constant value. This is a very simple idea. Of course, uh, MOND is a non-relativistic uh, uh, theory, so it cannot be tested on cosmological scales. Uh, for example, if you're using gravitational lensing, etc., you cannot use that. So, um, it, but there was, uh, in 2004, a generalization of this um, Tevez uh, tensor vector scalar models. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fully covariant um, a model uh, in which MOND is the, uh, the uh, classical limit of this theory. And there are many other ideas. For example, Eric Zerlinde's idea of emergent gravity. And I'm not saying that emergent gravity is not a good idea. I do not know. What I know is that this idea cannot compete for dark matter. So what I, what I know is that uh, the predictions then in emergent gravity are not good enough, actually, to replace dark matter in any way. Um, so uh, uh, already at the level of clusters, uh, so this is the bullet cluster. You may have seen that. It's called the bullet cluster because of this wave. This is a shock wave, which you can see, for example, if you see slow motion of a bullet in a medium, you can see the, the, the shock wave that has this shape. Actually, this is a shock wave. And um, the explanation of this system is that uh, two sub big sub-components si sub of this uh, system pass through each other, uh, pass through for the first time. If it is gravitational, it would pass many times and then be realized. But so far, it hasn't been realized. It passed through. The dark matter passed through, leaving behind the visible matter that you can see here in red. Um, for NASA, always gas is red and dark matter in blue. So you can see the colors here. But in any case, uh, most of the matter, uh, as seen in gravitational lensing, um, is segregated from where most of the gas, hot gas, is. Um, so. This already this uh, system cannot be explained uh, with um, by Tevez uh, only with visible matter. You needed at this point a two electron volt uh, neutrino that we know now the masses of the neutrinos. In any case, you need a two electron volt neutrino or some other type of dark matter uh, that they call dark cluster baryonic matter. So you cannot replace matter. That is for Tevez already at, at the level of uh, at the level of galaxy classes. But there is even something more, um, which is what I showed you before. Uh, no proposed alternative to dark matter can explain the CMB anisotropy spectrum and baryon acoustic oscillations. So here I am using, I'm still using, at some point I will have to replace that, but um, Dan Hooper made a beautiful <laughs> task. Uh, about a year ago, uh, I was 
one of the organizers of this conference in the KITP, uh, the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara. This is recorded. Um, there was a debate in this conference uh, between Eric Ferlinde and uh, Dan Hooper. And uh, he, he uh, it's very interesting. If you want, you can go there and, and, and for fun actually listen to it. So here it is uh, that um, in 2005 uh, with Tebes, I won't consider him even granting that there were this component uh, for of two electron volt neutrinos, they could reproduce the first two peaks within errors. The first two peaks of the CMB um, angular spectrum. But uh, not anymore after the data of Planck. The data of Planck, so this was, um, this was, uh, this was the data then. But now with Planck, you see this is the data that I showed you before, and Planck has many others. And so the, uh, there, is, there is no explanation by Tevez or any other um, alternative or, uh, theory that is portrayed as an alternative to dark matter. And it will be extremely difficult to explain this, because one of the elements here is that actually the um, uh, potential wells in dark matter during uh, the emission of CMB are always growing, growing, growing. So this uh, CMB emission happens in a, in a background where dark matter, the uh, inhomogeneities in dark matter are growing. Delta rho over rho is always uh, becoming larger. And this is extremely difficult to reproduce by anything else. So what about the um, matter power spectrum? I show you there are these wiggles here in the power matter spectrum. And these uh, baryon acoustic oscillations are relatively uh, small. And this is because of the effect of dark matter, because uh, the, uh, these uh, oscillations are suppressed as baryons are falling into the potential wells formed by dark matter. So the potential wells are, uh, are increasing. So when it expands, uh, the expansion is always a little bit less than uh, the contraction. Uh, the contraction becomes a little stronger, the expansion. And this is because the potential wells in which these oscillations happen are growing, are growing uh, uh, in, 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 in contra. So this is very difficult to reproduce. If there would be no, and this was computed by Dodelson in 2011, if there would be no dark matter that is producing this uh, difference, the baryon acoustic oscillation should be about 30 times larger than observed. So this is uh, the point. Whenever, and I heard, uh, uh, I, s I have seen in the newspapers recently, again, Eric Ferlin, they saying, that, so that's fine. Uh, emergent gravity may be a fantastic model of gravity, but so far what has predicted is only very primitive predictions actually for uh, rotation curves of galaxies. So whenever uh, you, claim you hear a claim of somebody um, saying that actually it has replaced dark matter, ask for their prediction of the power matter spectrum. If you don't have a prediction for the power matter spectrum, then you cannot replace dark matter, not as yet, right? That's the, that's the, the message. Okay. Um, so third property. Um, it's invisible. Dark matter is not observed to interact with light. That means it is either neutral or very has very small electromagnetic charges. It could have a very small um, electric charge, um, and if it has a very small electric charge, it could be self-standing, or it could be actually uh, um, a part of an atomic uh, dark matter in which you have a dark photon, uh, a dark electron. When I mention dark, um, I mention a whole sector that actually um, doesn't communicate with us except for very small, um, uh, very small coupling. So uh, dark didn't uh, start. So I did need my little clock after all. You see that. Uh, in any case, so you tell me how how uh, how should be done. Uh, okay, I will continue five more minutes. I guess uh, this is okay. So. Um, so this is the uh, millicharge. Uh, it could have a very small charge or actually a small electric or magnetic dipole or an anapole dark matter. I think there will be some uh, um, lectures about this. 
uh, the way in which this is done many times, for example, in charge is through a small coupling, for example, in this way. Um, as you know, if mu nu, if mu nu uh, in electromagnetics is what gives you the, it's a kinetic term because it gives you the propagator of the photon. If mu nu, uh, the, uh, the field uh, tensor, is a singlet uh, when you have a U1 gauge theory. And so if you have another U1 dark, uh, with a dark photon and so on, nothing prevents the to put these two singlets together uh, with a small coupling. And when you diagonalize then to, to find your actual dark photon and you, uh, your actual photon, you see that the actual photon has a little component of the dark photon. And so the charge of any particle that has the dark charge will be multiplied by epsilon for our, in our world, for our electromagnetism. And as I say, that this can be organized in atomic dark matter or even in mirror dark matter. Mirror dark matter is a whole standard model which is dark, but uh, maybe couples only with, with our world through a coupling like this. Um, there, there are dark of hidden photons. The dark or hidden photons may be part of the dark matter also. Um, this is the what I call epsilon, it's called here chi. There are many, many orders of magnitude. And it could be um, part, uh, it could be called dark matter even for a range of masses. Um, the bulk of the dark matter must be nearly dissipationless. Um, that is, it cannot cool by radiating as baryons do to form disks in the center of galaxies, or their extended dark halos wouldn't exist. So how is that our galaxy formed? You start with a proto-galaxy in which baryonic and dark matter are mixed. And maybe it has, typically, uh, it has uh, some uh, small angular momentum. Um, uh, in the course of time, baryons, baryonic atoms, molecules, uh, emit photons. Um, photons of different wavelengths and so on at different moments. But this emission is isotropic. So the baryonic matter loses energy without losing angular momentum. So as it becomes more and more concentrated, it must rotate faster because of conservation of angular momentum. And at some point, uh, because of this rotation, uh, there is an instability that develops for the formation of a disk. So this is how this forms. If dark matter would be as dissipational as baryonic matter, then all of it would be would have fallen in the and would be as small. Uh, so so this extended. Uh, uh, extended halos wouldn't exist. But maybe 10%, so in our galaxies, about 10% is baryonic, right? And this is dissipative. So what about if maybe 10% of it, uh, of the dark matter is uh, dissipational? This is in the idea of having a whole dark sector, which you have different type of dark matter. Huh? So part of it could be dissipation. It couldn't emit photons, but it could emit dark photons, right? For example. So this is the idea of partially interacting dark matter, PIDM. Special case of it is a double disk dark matter in which always you will form a, a disk, dark matter disk, which may be inclined with respect to the baryonic disk. And even there was this very uh, fun idea that maybe the extinction, the periodic extinction happens uh, when uh, our solar system uh, goes through a <laughs> dark halo. In any case, uh, Uh, the, the, this, uh, it depends, you know what? It is possible, yes. Nothing, it hasn't been studied exactly because, you know, uh, for example, a structure formation people, you know, the time, you do what, what you consider most useful. It hasn't been studied. But if it is a few percent, uh, you wouldn't be able to say. It's a strange uh, idea, but it has not been rejected as yet. Yes. Okay. Um, I will finish in a, in a minute, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to get to the to the, to the full uh, uh, strength, full length. Um, dark matter has been mostly assumed to be collisionless. However, the upper limit on dark matter self-interactions is huge. The limit is on the ratio of the self-interaction divided by the mass, and this comes from the, from the mean free path. The mean free path, if you see, depends on the ratio of the mass over the uh, self-interaction. 
And you see, I put it in barns because uh, you know barn. Barns is a typical cross-section in nuclear physics. So for example, the neutron capture on ur uranium-235 uh, is a few barns. So here, if you have um, a mass of the particle, which is maybe 100, um, 100 GVs, you will have a self-interaction that is 200 barns. It's huge. It's a huge self-interaction. And it is a still, uh, is still possible. If uh, the uh, dark matter has close to this maximum, and the maximum changes, the maximum allowed changes, uh, is uh, uh, a smaller at larger, uh, uh, for larger scales. So for larger scales, you should not affect much. Uh, and for smaller scales, you would want to have these scales, this change in introduced by SIDM, self-interacting dark matter. If this, uh, dark matter is very close to the upper limit, then you do something. What you do is that you would erase a part of a part of a small scale in galaxies. You could flatten out the central regions um, of the dwarf galaxies. This is what you will have. Uh, but you do not have, uh, you must not actually change much the things where you know that can be very well explained um, without self-interactions. And so having a large self-interactions at the smaller scales and a negligible one on larger scales points to li li light mediators, mass zero or very light, because then you have a velocity-dependent cross-section. This is like rather for a scattering. You have a study rather for a scattering. It goes as 1 over uh, kinetic energy to a square, right? The kinetic energy is d squared, so this is 1 over d squared. So light mediators is in, the, in this. And I think uh, I, may, I may finish um, uh, here and continue later. Uh, the mass of the major component of dark matter has only been constrained within 90 orders of magnitude. The smaller mass is here, fuzzy dark matter, which is a boson with a de Broglie wavelength uh, uh, of, of one kiloparsecs. If it would be a smaller mass, the de Broglie wavelength will, will be larger, you wouldn't be able to fit uh, this dark matter within uh, dwarf galaxies. And on the other side, so here you have uh, ultra light bosons, actions, sterile neutrinos, light dark matter, winds, Planck scale, and so on. Machos is what is at the other end, macroscopic halo objects. Uh, microscopic halo objects have been studied since the 19. Uh, 90 in microlensing. Microlensing is an event in which one of these objects would pass through inter intervening in the line of sight of a star and then will magnify actually the image of the star. And um, the limits were obtained in 1990 and 2000 on the fraction, very good limits which combined with others actually gave uh, very good uh, limits on matches. Problem with matches is how you would form them. You couldn't form them uh, very easily without leaving some debris that you would see. So the only candidates, actually, from the standpoint of how to form them that could for machos are primordial black holes. Primordial black holes are black holes that are not the end stage of a large star. They are not stellar, but they are produ produced in an early phase transition. Um, there are have been this uh, crazy but you know interesting idea that maybe the black holes observed by LIGO, uh, LIGO has observed several mergers of uh, tens of solar masses, black, black holes of tens of solar masses. Could they be the dark matter? And this idea um, uh, produced a re-examination of many of the limits and um, here is where the machos and the, the limits I showed you earlier in microlensing and others, there they leave a little window, if, uh, if you want, precisely at the scale of tens of solar masses, which are there. Um, this is for a single mass. Um, in particular, um, uh, this limit is due to evaporation, due to the Hawking radiation, then to the uh, minus... Um, uh, 10 to the 15 grams 
10 to the minus 17 point three almost uh, solar masses. But um, all these uh, limits that are in dashed lines actually have been uh, re-examined. And now there is a window actually between 10 to the minus 15 and 10 to the minus 10 solar masses where actually black holes could constitute the whole of layer of matter. Or it could be actually an extended mass function. Again, this is for just assuming that all the dark matter is in a particular mass uh, delta function, and mass function. If it is an extended mass function, then you can have uh, at every single mass, it will be less than the less than certain fraction, but then when you sum over the whole mass extension, you could get the bigger masses. Now, um, and uh, this is the last one of this uh, series. Um, so here you have that the limits on machos and primordial black holes, and the fact that particles particle candidates can have the right relic abundance to be the dark matter, constitute the only observational arguments we have in favor of dark matter elementary particle candidates. So the argument is, what else could it be? This is the best argument that we have, right? So from now on, I will concentrate on particle dark matter candidates, and then let me stop here about 10 minutes. Question. 